Let's see, let's just try a couple little questions here. Just to jog your memory. Let's try this number 42, the Poisley equation given below. So whenever I say that, I like break into a French accent. The Poisley equation. <laughs> Okay, so this equation given below describes the flow rate. We saw this last time. Uh, a fluid flow flows to a pipe at a rate Q. If the length of the pipe is increased by a factor of 2, what is the new flow rate? So with everything, we have Q. What happens if we increase the length of the pipe by a factor of 2? What happens to the flow rate? Alrighty, let's stop at one ten. One ten. Okay, awesome. Uh, C is the right answer. You should expect some questions like this, just, you know, where you have the equation, and I ask if you change something, what happens to something else? It's a useful skill for you to know that, how one variable changing that one variable affects something else. So here, if I'm increasing L by a factor of 2, I put a 2 there. In order to balance this, I have to have a 1 half on the other side. So the answer is C, 1 half. Um, so, for example, if I were to increase my pressure differential by a factor of 2, have a greater pressure differential, meaning that the difference between the pressure at one point and another point will now be higher, that will increase my, my flow rate by the same amount. And then if I increase my radius, say, for example, by a factor of 2, that's going to be a 2 to the fourth over here. So if I increase my radius, if I make it bigger, but keep everything else the same, then it's going to increase my Q by a factor of 2 to the 4th, which is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 16. Are you just stretching? Okay. All right. Have to work those minor muscles, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, over here, let's just try a couple others. I think we've done some of these, but let's, uh, well, that was the last test, wasn't it? Didn't we have part of this chapter on the last test? We did. Okay. Well, let's just move on then. We'll come back to it later. All right. Uh, so now we're moving into the section on the human body. Uh, let's look at the circulatory system first. You probably know this. I'm sure you've had AMP already. Is that right? Anatomy. Um, so hopefully a lot of it's just review, even sort of a more basic review probably. And I have to warn you that I don't really know a whole lot about the circulatory system. I've sort of been learning about it. So you probably know more than me. But that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to know more than me because, you know, that's what y'all do. And that's not really my thing. Um, but the circulatory system has two parts. You have the systemic circuit. And then what's the second one? The pulmonary, right. The pulmonary goes where? To the lungs, right. And the systemic circuit goes where? It goes out to your body, right? So the pulmonary circuit takes the blood from your heart to your lungs. And the systemic circuit uh, takes it from the heart to the body, to all the body, all the outer reaches of the body. So the systemic circuit, as we'll see, is a lot longer than the pulmonary circuit. Because, you know, the pulmonary circuit just goes from, like, right here to right here. 
but the systemic circuit goes from right here all the way throughout your entire body. And we'll see the effects of that on the flow rate uh, in the systemic circuit versus the pulmonary circuit and the, uh, and the pressures that are involved. Uh, we'll consider these, this system, both of these systems, to be a closed system. They talk about this in your book. Oh, excuse me. It's a closed system, so the flow rate will be constant. This isn't entirely true, but it's almost true. Remember, a closed system, when we say that we have a closed system, that means that there are no fluids entering or leaving the system. And because of that, uh, this idea that the flow rate is constant, which is based on a law, what was the law that the, the idea that the flow rate, the bar flow rate Q, it's a volume over time. Your rate of flow of some volume per unit time. If the flow rate is constant, what does that say about the total amount of matter in the system? It's the same. It doesn't change. That's called the conservation of matter. That if I don't have any matter entering or leaving the system, then that total amount of matter is going to remain the same. And as a result, this has to be true. Now, as you know, that's not entirely true. That is, this assumption isn't entirely true, but it's mostly true. You do have some fluids that are sort of being put into and taken out of the circulatory system, but on the whole, when compared to the whole flow of the system, it's fairly small. All right. Um, whenever you have viscous flow, go back to our Poiseuille equation. Remember, our Q is equal to pi r to the fourth times delta P, R is just the radius of your, your pipe or your tube or whatever. Delta P is your pressure differential, the change in pressure as it flows along, divided by eight, eta L. What does this variable represent, the eta, the Greek letter eta? That represents the viscosity. So anytime I have a viscous fluid that's flowing, I have to have some difference in pressure. So if I have a viscous fluid, you know, that is a fluid with a viscosity, like blood, for example, which is a fairly viscous fluid. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Where was I? Uh, you need a continual drop in pressure. And that's that delta P. That delta P has to be bigger than zero. I have to have a difference in pressure as I'm traveling along your pipe or your tube or whatever. If I have a flow that's in this direction, the pressure here, I'll call this P1, has to be bigger than P2. That's what that means, that P1 has to be bigger than P2 if I have a viscous fluid. Now, if I don't have a viscous fluid, that's not true. Uh, I can have just a constant pressure and it'll still flow. But anytime I have a viscous fluid, because it's always slowing down, remember we can think of viscosity as friction. And so if I have a really, if I have a lot of friction and I push it, it's going to eventually stop unless I keep pushing it. And so if I have a viscous fluid, I have to keep pushing that fluid along. Otherwise, it's just going to stop and it's not going to flow anymore. Okay? So we have that in the circulatory system that we have this. Uh, this continual drop in pressure. Now, in our systemic circuit, you should know the major parts of the systemic and the pulmonary circuit, and also the major parts of the heart. I suspect you already know that, but just if you don't, it's in your book. We'll go over it in class as well. But in the systemic circuit, you have uh, blood flows from the aorta. To the, where does it go after the aorta? 
Y'all don't know this? Y'all know this. Huh? No, after it leaves the heart. In the systemic circuit. So it leaves the heart. No, it goes into the arteries. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. You don't have to know it. But you need to know it for the test. Okay? Okay. So it goes from the aorta to the arteries to the arterioles. Am I saying that right? Uh, and then where? To the capillaries, right. And then it will return back to the heart in that systemic circuit. Uh, coming back, so this is all leaving the heart. And when it's coming back, Uh, it goes through the uh, venules, right? Thank you. The veins. And then somebody said it. Well, the what? Right, the vena cava. That's just before, as it's entering the heart. Vena cava. I'm sorry, what? Oh, valves, yeah. Uh, so anyway, those are sort of the major parts of that systemic circuit. And as I flow from the aorta to the ar arteries, to the arterioles, and then to the capillaries, and then back, I'm going to have a continual drop in pressure. So where will I have the largest pressure? Whereabouts? In the aorta, right? Right after the heart pumps and sends that blood into the aorta, it's going to uh, have the highest pressure here. And then continually, it'll have a lower and lower and lower pressure as it goes here and here and here. And then it'll come back into the heart. And then it goes to the uh, pulmonary circuit. But once it comes back to the heart, it it's, gets that new pressure back again. Um, you have four chambers of the heart. I'll show you a figure, but let me just write it down here. Four chambers. You'll need to be able to identify these on a diagram almost guarantee you that you'll have this on the test where I just give you a picture of the heart and you can see the picture that I'll give you. It's on one of the old tests and I'll show you in just a bit. And I'll just ask you to identify either the four chambers or the aorta or the vena cava. You don't need to know all the valves, but you do need to know the, the four chambers of the heart, the left and right ventricle, the left and right atrium, and then also the uh, vena cava. Be able to identify that on a figure and be able to identify the aorta. Okay? So you have four chambers of the heart. The left and right atrium. This is on the top part, right, of the heart. I always think of the atrium like you go into a hotel. And what is an atrium in a hotel, a fancy hotel? It's like a what now? I like a lobby where it has a big window. I always think of an atrium. It has to have a big window up top, right? And so in a similar way, the atrium of your heart is up top. Right? I don't know. If that helps you remember it, that's fine. If not, that's fine too. Uh, what's that? Okay, that works too. A comes before V. And so A is up top and V is in the bottom. And then you also have the uh, left and right ventricles. And as you're looking at a figure, look, here's my heart. Oh, it's like for Valentine's Day, right? Uh, if I split it up into four parts, remember that the left and right is switched, right? As you're looking at the figure, so the left atrium is right here. The right atrium is right here. I don't know why. I guess because, like, if it's my heart, my left atrium is on this side. But if you're looking at my heart, it's on your right. I think that's why. Is that why? Yeah. Okay. Anatomical position, right. And then the... Uh, the right ventricles here, the left ventricles here. Now, there is a figure in your book. Pull it up. This is it. Yeah, this is from your book. Uh, so this shows the. Uh, uh, can y'all see that sort of kind of? It's on your book. It's pages 50 to 70 or so, somewhere around there. Yeah, it's on page 52. If you want to follow there. 
so here we have the right atrium. This is the vena cava where it's coming back into the right atrium. Uh, and then it goes into the right ventricle uh, where then it goes to the aorta. Am I right about that? Pulmonary artery. All oh, right. I knew that. It goes into the pulmonary artery because that has to go to the lungs where it's reoxygenated or resupplied or whatever. It goes to the lungs. And then it comes back through the pulmonary vein and goes into the uh, left atrium and then to the left ventricle and then out into the systemic circuit again. Okay? If you don't know that, make sure that you do know it. Uh, just sort of the basics of how blood flows through the heart and what it goes, the basics of the systemic circuit as well. Okie dokie. Okay. That's in your book. Uh, let's see. Let's just draw a few little clicker questions. Give you a little feel for it. So consider this diagram of a human heart. Where is the blood pressure the lowest? At what point? A, B, C, D, or E? Uh, where is the blood pressure the lowest? At, at point A, point B, point C, D, or E? All right. Oh, uh, y'all are sort of all over the board. Y'all try to like, settle on an answer because, like, everybody has a different answer, okay? Where is the blood pressure the lowest? We said this before. In your body, where is the blood pressure the lowest? Just don't know. Yeah, you're still all over the place. All right, I'm going to stop at 108. All right, let me show you what you put. Uh, let's see. A is the right answer. Good. It sort of rallied there right at the end. Because, you know, after the blood goes through your systemic circuit, the systemic circuit is a long way for the blood to flow through your body, right? And as it's going along, it continually has a drop in pressure. And so just before it enters the heart is where it has the lowest pressure. And so point A is called what? The vena cava, right? Just before it enters the heart again is where it has the lowest pressure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. You know what the answer was? What, what? Huh? It was me. Yeah. Uh, in the previous figure, what location is the left atrium? So the left atrium, same options, A, B, C, D, or E. A, B, C, D, or E. All right, I'll stop at 25. 25. Yeah, this this might be a joke. I have a good one, too. Yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, I just heard this when my son told it to me. Uh, what did zero say to eight? What did zero say to eight? And then you say what? You say I. I don't know, you know, what or whatever. Hey, hey, nice belt. Zero is round. Eight is like this. Eight is wearing a belt. <laughs> that's, a, like, that's one of the best ones I've heard in a long time. All right, where is the blood just before heading off to the lungs? A, B, C, D, or E? Uh, where is blood just before it heads off to the lungs? A, B, C, D, or E? Already? Okay, good. Uh, I'll stop at 33. 
Okay, and C is the right answer. Uh, it's a little misleading. It is the, uh, what's this, the right ventricle. But really, it comes up into this pulmonary vein. All right, if that was labeled, that would also be. I'm sorry. You know what I meant to write. Okay? Now the parts of the heart. Um, you know, print it out or whatever. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Okay. I'll have a little video to show it to you. We'll come back to the iron lung. Um, all right, so as we said, there must be this continual drop in pressure as you go through the systemic circuit. So the highest pressure is where in the systemic circuit? In the aorta. And then the lowest pressure in the systemic circuit is in the vena cava. In fact, that's the lowest pressure overall is in the vena cava. Uh, so Poisson's law says that uh, the pressure must be higher for a longer or for flow through a longer system. All right, because remember our Poisson's law was that our flow rate is pi r to the fourth delta p divided by a data l. So if I have an increased, if my flow rate has to be constant throughout the entire system, if I have an increased L in some portion of it, then I also must have an increased delta P. I have to have a higher pressure differential. So which of our systems is longer, the pulmonary or the systemic circuit? The systemic circuit. So I'll have a higher pressure in that systemic circuit or a higher pressure differential in that systemic circuit because it's just longer. So delta P is higher. in the systemic circuit. Let me show you a picture of the systemic circuit. We'll ask a couple questions about it. Uh, let's see. OK, so this is the, uh, the systemic circuit. As I go from the aorta to the arteries to the arterioles to the capillaries, and then back again to the heart through the venules, the veins, and the vena cava. Now we've already said that the the flow rate has to be constant all throughout this because there is no fluid either coming into or leaving it. So you can't have a different flow rate through any part of it. So the flow rate must be constant. I don't know if you remember, but we defined our flow rate as the cross-sectional area times the speed. If I think about the units of this, this gives me uh, meters squared for cross-sectional area, meters per second. And so if I look at those units, that gives me a meters cubed or cubic meters per second. That our flow rate is also equal to our area times our speed. This came up in the previous section uh, in terms of the continuity equation. The continuity equation if you recall said that A1 V1 equals A2 V2 right and you all went home and you got your water hose and you put your thumb over the end and you say huh the continuity equation is correct right because if I decrease the area of my opening, what happens to the speed? 
it increases as well. If I decrease the area, I put in my thumb over the end of the water hose, then I also increase the speed. And your nozzles and stuff, they do similar things. They decrease the area and increase the speed. But you can do it very simply with your thumb. So uh, what happens here? If I, in, if I decrease my area, what must happen to my speed? It has to increase. So let's think about our capillaries. Capillaries big or small compared to the aorta? They're very small, right? Compared to the aorta, aorta is maybe about that big, right? Ish. Then the capillaries are itty bitty. So what happens to the flow of blood when it goes through the capillaries? You'd think, huh? But does it increase? No, actually through the capillaries, it actually slows down. So that doesn't really jive with this, with the whole continuity equation, right? No, but it really does. Because if we think about the total area, right here I have one aorta. It's roughly, yeah, I can stick my thumb in it, I think, right? About that. I have one aorta, and then it splits into more arteries, even more arterioles, and even more capillaries. And so it turns out that the total cross-sectional area of the capillaries is bigger or smaller than the cross-sectional area of the aorta. It's going to be quite a lot bigger. And that's why your blood flow is so much slower in the capillaries, at least in terms of this continuity equation, because the area of the capillaries is quite a lot bigger than the area of the aorta, and bigger than the arterioles, the arteries, and also the aorta. Let me write that down. So the the area, meaning the cross-sectional area of the capillaries, is bigger than the arterioles, arteries, and the aorta is bigger than any one of those. So the blood flow is slower through the capillaries. And that's a nice application of our continuity equation. If I increase the area, my speed has to go down. Or if I decrease my area, my speed has to go up. But in this case, as I flow through the systemic circuit, then the, uh, the speed will slow down because my area is getting bigger. OK? Uh, just for some reference, I'll, just, I'll erase this over on the left. In the systemic circuit, the pressure is about 80 to 120 millimeters of mercury. We'll talk about what that means, though we've already seen that. You probably know what it means. And in the pulmonary circuit, it's quite a bit lower. Why is the pressure in the pulmonary circuit so much lower than in the systemic circuit? It's shorter, right, because that L is smaller, and so I need a smaller pressure. It all goes back to that, that flow equation, the Poiseuille equation. I should get like a fake accent, huh? Which accent do you think I should get? Like a French accent? Australian, huh? Australian, yeah. I don't know if I can pull it off. Okay, so uh, in the pulmonary circuit, remember, because L is so much shorter for the pulmonary circuit, the pressure is going to be smaller. And so just for reference, the, in the pulmonary circuit, it's, uh, it's about 10 to 25 millimeters of mercury. All right, so it's almost a tenth of the pressure that you have in the systemic circuit. But you have to have that higher pressure in the systemic circuit because it's so long, you have to push that blood throughout the entire body, and then it has to return back to the heart. All righty? So a couple of nice applications of both the Poiseuille equation and the equation of continuity in our circulatory system. You should understand how they apply there, like we talked about here, uh, about the lengths of the systems, the uh, areas of the systems, and how that applies to the blood flow. You can see that on the test. 
All right, let's look at blood pressure measurements, how you measure blood pressure. May I take this away? By the way, uh, after class today, is that true? I think it's after class. My wife is going to have a telescope set up out in the quad to look at the sun, if you want to go look at the sun as you're walking out. I'm pretty sure it's after this class. I think she wanted to get sort of this class in the next period. So if you want to go see the sun, just go out through the quad and just go over and tell her and say, hey, I want to see the sun. Okay? That's pretty cool. I don't know if it's very active, but uh, you can get to see her. That would be fun. Okay. I get some more pages here. Okay, let's look at blood pressure measurements. Um, is blood pressure, when we measure our blood pressure, we're going to use, a, what's it called, a sphig? See, picking up the lingo, right? Is that what y'all call it, a sphig? Uh, when you do a blood pressure measurement, is this an absolute pressure? Travis, what's up? Is it a blood, uh, absolute pressure? Or is it a gauge pressure? When I measure a blood pressure, is this a, a uh, an absolute pressure or is it a gauge pressure? Right, I'll stop at 22. 22. You're not even going to get a joke for this because even though you got 100%. Uh, this is a, a gauge pressure, and we know that because when I'm when I don't when I'm not measuring a blood pressure with your sphig, what what pressure does it read? It reads zero, right? And it's sort of like the tire with the air pressure gauge. If your tire's flat, you read zero. But you really know in your mind that there's 100,000 newtons per square meter of pressure inside that tire, right, because that's the atmospheric pressure. In a similar way, your sigmometer, whatever, yeah, that thing, uh, it also is sitting in the atmospheric pressure. So um, it's measuring an gauge pressure, not absolute pressure. Because when it is at atmospheric pressure, and atmospheric pressure is nothing to bat an eyelash at. It, it's fairly high pressure, 100,000 newtons per square meter. When it's at atmospheric pressure, it measures a pressure equal to zero uh, millimeters of mercury. Let's see if I do this. Let me just remind you where this comes about. That this measurement, we had this last time, but let me just remind you that if I have a tube that's open like this, if it's filled with some fluid, like mercury, for example. I have one pressure that's pushing down over here. I'll call this P1. And then I have another pressure over here. That's P2. And I can tell the difference between those pressures based on the difference in this height. And that height is physically the millimeters of mercury. When you see that little tube of mercury rising up in the glass vial, uh, it's measuring the height of this column. And then you're using that to figure out what is the pressure. So that's where that, that unit for pressure, the millimeters of mercury, comes from. And in fact, you've probably heard atmospheric pressure represented in that way as atmospheric pressure is measured something you use a barometer. The atmospheric pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. You've heard of this before. 
think it has another unit too. I forget right now what it is. Do you I don't remember. Anyway, uh, if I have my fluid in here, I have a certain pressure that's pushing down on it, and it pushes it up into this tube, and then we measure this distance, and that's our distance H. Uh, these two things, we mentioned this last time, but this is called a manometer, and this is a very special case of a manometer. It's called a barometer, which you might have heard of before. That's how you measure atmospheric pressure. A barometer and a manometer are basically the same, except for a barometer. Don't write this down. You won't see this on the test. But a barometer, uh, the pressure here is equal to zero. So here you're comparing an unknown pressure to a known pressure. And here you're comparing an unknown pressure to zero. That's the only difference. Anyway, that's where that unit comes from. Um, when we measure our blood pressure, we get two numbers. For example, you know, pretty good blood pressure is 120 and 80. This is in millimeters of mercury. Uh, 120, the higher the two, this is the pressure when the heart contracts. And then the 80 is, uh, or I'm sorry, this is called the systolic pressure. Systolic actually means uh, contraction. You'll need to know the definition of these, sort of what this means. What is systolic? What is diastolic? So if you don't know that now, then you'll, you'll need to know. And then the, the lower number is the pressure when the heart relaxes. And this is called what pressure? The diastolic, right. And diastole actually means... Do I know what it means? Yeah, it means a drawing apart. I don't know what root it is, like what language, but it means a drawing apart. So the diastolic pressure is when the heart relaxes. That's the smaller of the two pressures. Right? If the heart, you can go back to our Boyle's law, our pressure and volume. If our volume of the heart gets bigger when it relaxes, that means the pressure goes down. As your book points out, uh, Boyle's law is really supposed to be just for gases. Do you remember Boyle's law? PV is constant. But we can think of it here as well. Boyle's law is that PV is constant. Another idea that you need to be familiar with for the next test, it will come up again, and we'll see it again here. But this can also, we can also imagine it with the heart that when the heart's volume is big, the pressure is low. When the heart's volume is small, the pressure is big. Similarly goes for your lungs, as we talked about already. Okie dokie. Um, is that all? Oh, so we can think of this in terms of Boyle's law. We can also think of it in terms of Pascal's law. All right, do y'all remember what Pascal's law said? It had to do with the hydraulic lift. Right, the hydraulic lift comes about because of Pascal's law. You recall? It's okay if you don't. Uh, if I apply a pressure in a fluid at any point, that pressure is felt all the way throughout that fluid. So, you know, imagine your heartbeat. I can feel my heartbeat right now. I'm feeling a pressure that is being exerted in my heart. And that pressure is being exerted all throughout the system. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Like the pressure that's being exerted right here, I can feel in my wrist, or I can feel it up here, I can feel it all over. Because that pressure, that change in pressure that's caused in my heart is felt all throughout the system. Now, as we know, that pressure changes because of the viscosity of the blood and what have you. So, Alrighty, uh, so Pascal's law. 
Um, when a change in pressure is experienced at any point in a fluid, or is experienced in a fluid, that same change in pressure is felt through all, throughout. I'm sorry, I don't know why it's changing colors on me. And that's what allows us to feel our heartbeat. We've already had Pascal's on. I know we had it on the previous test, but you could see it in, in reg regards to this, both Boyle's law and Pascal's law. I could ask you some question about, you know, what law allows you to feel your heartbeat when you're when you're feeling of your wrist or whatever? Okay, and you would say, well, that's Pascal's law. Okay, okay. Or I could also ask you in terms of Boyle's law, when your heart contracts. What law governs why the pressure goes up? And that will be Boyle's law. Sort of, kind of, with that, with that caveat that Boyle's law is really supposed to apply to gases, and it does apply to gases, but in this case it also applies, sort of, to uh, a liquid. All right. Um, I think that's all on the heart and the circulatory system. All right. Um, we're going to skip the section on intravenous medication. So if you're in your book, um, it looks like it starts on about page 56 through 57. So we'll skip that section, okay, on intravenous. So if you're following along in your book for the test, which is a good way to study for the test, you can skip the little section on intravenous medication. We're not going to have that at all. I don't know. It's, there's a lot of numbers involved. It often just sort of throws students for a loop, and it's not really terribly important for us. Okay, let's look at coronary arteries. Uh, in the coronary artery, the artery becomes blocked with cholesterol. So if, when you have this artery, you know, it gets blocked up partially, uh, the blood is flowing in this direction, and it gets partially blocked so that the, the radius of the artery actually becomes smaller, what then causes the pressure? Like what will happen to the pressure? Thanks, Carly. All right. Oh, who else was it? Everybody? Okay. Yeah, so maybe that's too easy. If I have this decrease in the radius of my artery, then it's going to cause an increase in the pressure. Okay? So a decrease in the radius, because remember, our Poisson equation, which was uh, Q is pi r to the fourth delta P over 8 A to L. If I have a decrease in the radius, if this goes down, in order for my flow rate to go up, then my pressure differential has to go up. All right? So if R decreases, the pressure differential, delta P, increases. Now, there is sort of a caveat to this. What happens to the flow rate? As my blood is flowing into the artery, I have a certain speed that it's flowing here. What happens right here? What's going to happen to that speed? Is it going to, don't say anything, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Or is it going to stay the same? So I want to know what happens to the speed right here. Is the speed going to go up? Is it going to go down? Or is it going to stay the same? 
what will happen to the speed when it enters into this this area right here? Up, down, or stay the same? All right, I'll stop at say 28. Okay, awesome. A is the right answer. This goes back to our continuity equation. A1V1 equals A2V2. Here, this is my cross-sectional area, A1. At a certain speed, V1. This is V2. And notice that my cross-sectional area, A2, is quite a bit reduced. And so if A2 goes down, that means that V2 has to go up. So my speed in this blocked coronary artery is going to go up. I'll have an increased speed. Uh, it will also, because my radius is going down, it will increase my pressure differential. Now, if you know, you all know much about coronary arteries, what can happen in a coronary artery? What can happen to this? Okay, before that, before it gets completely blocked, does anybody know what can happen to this coronary artery? No. That would be bad. It can collapse. It can just sort of collapse down upon itself and then allow no blood to flow at all. What would cause it to collapse? In thinking about the pressure, right? What would cause it to collapse to the pressure right here? What would have to happen to the pressure at this point to cause this artery to collapse, to just fall in on itself? It would have to decrease, right? So there's another law or another principle uh, that's not in your book called the Bernoulli's principle. Don't write this down. I'm not going to ask you about it. It's not in the book, but it's important. And so if you ever hear this, that well, if you have a coronary artery, you run the, the risk of it actually collapsing. This is why. Bernoulli's, oh, is it a law? It's based on a law. I think it's a principle. It's a principle to live your life by. Like that. Bernoulli's principle says that the total amount of energy in a fluid remains constant. And basically, the result of that says that if your speed goes up, then the pressure goes down. Now, that seems a little confusing, right? And I think that's why they didn't include it in the book. Because on the one hand, we say that our pressure is going up if our radius goes down. And then Bernoulli comes along. It says that if my speed goes up, my pressure goes down. By the way, Bernoulli's principle is the same idea behind a wing, an air, airplane wing, that I have these fluids, that, this fluid that comes along, it splits and goes over and under the aircraft wing. Uh, on the top, I have a big speed. On the bottom, I have a small speed. So because I have a big speed on the top, I have a low pressure. And that's how I get lift. And on the bottom, I have high pressure. When I have a low speed, I have a high pressure. I'll bring a little demo next time. It's pretty cool. I'll show you this. But uh, So Bernoulli's principle says that when my speed increases, my pressure decreases. So when my speed here increases, my local pressure, the pressure right here, decreases, whereas the pressure differential, which is what this is talking about, this is talking about the difference in the pressure between two points here and here is going to increase. Okay, so they're talking about very similar but a little bit different things. Bernoulli's principle talks about the local pressure at this particular point is going to decrease, but overall the pressure differential, the difference in pressure will increase. Again, I'm not going to ask you about Bernoulli's principle or any of this, but if you see this elsewhere, that's, that's where it comes from. It's because if I have an increased speed, my pressure decreases. So by the way, when you put your finger on the water hose and close it off, what happens to the pressure of that water coming out of the water hose when you squirt somebody with it? It does what now? No, it doesn't increase. It decreases. Because it speeds up, yeah, that's what everybody always says. It seems like the pressure increases, 
but the pressure actually does decrease. You can try this. I mean, you can uh, you can just sort of have your hose out just squirting water and put your hand in it, and it sort of bats your hand away. But then when you, because it has a high pressure, but if I put my finger over it and then I, I put my hand there, I don't feel as much force because the pressure is less. It's subtle, but it, it's there. Okay. Alrighty, coronary arteries. Okay, now let's look at the lungs. Remember Boyle's Law. We had it on the last test, but you can see it again on this test with regards to the lungs. Uh, Boyle's Law just says that PV is constant. And remember, we talked about this last time, and we'll see it with the iron lung as well, that the iron lung does this. But I have a diaphragm underneath my lungs. When I breathe in, that diaphragm expands my chest cavity, which causes the volume to go up. And if the volume goes up, the pressure inside my chest cavity has to go down. So I have a low pressure inside my lungs, a high pressure outside my lungs your air is going to flow from high to low pressure, so it'll come into my mouth and down my lungs. And then when I breathe out, <sighs> my chest cavity gets smaller, and it, it, uh, it's not so much that it pushes that air out. You can think of it more as my volume gets smaller, so my pressure goes up. So then air will move from high pressure inside my lungs to low pressure outside my lungs. So no Boyle's Law on how that applies. Um, Let's also look at this video about the iron lung. Actually, let me finish this a little bit more. Uh, the lungs bring oxygen to the blood. Are the lungs are the lungs bring oxygen to the blood? That oxygen is from outside body. The oxygen, not the blood, is outside the body. Um, and the lungs are not muscles. I mentioned this, but it's true. The lungs are not muscles. Uh, instead, the muscles around the lungs contract or relax to make them expand. Contract or relax. I'm sorry. To uh, to open the chest cavity, rather to close or open the chest cavity. All right. So if you don't already understand how Boyle's law applies to the lungs, let's also look at the iron lung. Are you all familiar with the iron lung, what that is? Well, back when people had polio a lot, they, they lost a lot of their muscle mass, and they just weren't able to breathe very well because their muscles were very weak. And so they would put them into the, this iron lung that would help them to breathe. And the iron lung basically caused you to have high pressure inside. You put, put yourself into this container with just your head sticking out, and the container would have a high pressure, low pressure. High pressure low pressure. High pressure to make you exhale, low pressure to make you inhale, or to help you exhale and inhale. So that's all the iron lung is. I think they still use them today, uh, but you know, polio is not such a, an issue in the United States anymore, so uh, we just don't see them as much. Well, let's watch this video. It's fairly interesting. It's uh, from a medical, a medical history museum, and they talk about sort of the history of polio and, and um, how this is used.
There's a little section in your book about the iron lung. Just make sure you know how it works and how it applies to Boyle's law. That it changes the pressure inside the container where you are, and that allows you to breathe, or at least helps you to breathe. Okay, we're almost done. Let's do the eye and then the brain. We're done up in this chapter. We're going to come back to the eye later when we get into the section on light, which is a number of chapters from here. And so we'll talk about the eye and how it works. It's really pretty phenomenal how the eye takes light from outside and transmits that information to your brain. But for this chapter, we're just going to look at the pressure because your eye is filled with a fluid. Uh, some of that fluid is replenished. Some of that fluid is not replenished. Uh, and then there's also pressure issues that can come up in the human eye, uh, or in any eye, actually where either you have too much pressure or too little pressure. So uh, the intraocular pressure, that means like the pressure inside the eye. This is the pressure in the eye, inside the eyeball, it is uh, usually about 10 to 20 millimeters per mercury. 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. So fairly small. We can have some issues with this. If you have high pressure in the eye, a pressure that's that's higher than this, I know what this is called. If you have too much pressure, this is called glaucoma. And if you have low pressure, Well, what will happen if you have a pressure inside the eyeball, a pressure of the fluid inside the eyeball that, that's too low? It's not a technical term. What will happen to your eyeball? It's going to collapse, just like the artery, right? So if you have a pressure that's too low, you can have a uh, collapse of the eyeball. Never happened to me. I don't know. Doesn't sound very good. All right, so if you have a low pressure, you get a uh, collapse of the eyeball. You get several parts to the eye. The cornea, which is the uh, outer surface of the eye. And the aqueous humor. Uh, this is a fluid that is replenished. It's replenished regularly. Let me see. Uh, the aqueous humor, that is in the front part of your eye. This, gosh, is it in the lens? I forget. Let's get these mixed up. The vitreous humor is inside the ball. I think the aqueous humor is inside. Do y'all know? Is that right, Bria? You think so? You look like you know what you're talking about. I do not. Let's see. Yeah, the aqueous humor, continuously reduced. Yeah, it's in the front of the eye. We'll come back to this in a later chapter and we'll talk about it. But just know that the aqueous humor, if I think about my eye, <laughs> here I have a picture I'll show you. The aqueous humor, yeah, is right here. And this is a fluid that's continually replenished. So this is the front part of your eyeball. This is the cornea. The outer part right here is just a clear covering. And then the aqueous humor is a fluid here that uh, is continually replenished. It helps to sort of keep the shape of the eye, but it also brings nutrients and stuff to the eye. The vitreous humor, which is this fluid inside the eyeball, the vitreous humor helps to keep the shape. This is not replenished. The vitreous humor is not replenished. And so whatever you have when you're born is what you got for the rest of your life, the vitreous humor. 
Okay. You hear people talking about how they see things. They have floaters. That happens when you get stuff that in the vitreous humor that sort of moves around like specks of whatever. So we'll talk about that later. But for now, know the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor. Um, you also need to know the lens. This is the lens. It uh, focuses light on the retina. And the retina is here at the back of the eye, right here. So in short, you need to know the cornea, the aqueous humor, and the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor is in that front part of your eye. It is replenished. And that's how you can have issues with pressure in your eye, is if it's replenished too much. Like you get too much aqueous humor being put into that by your body, or it gets clogged up in some way, it's not allowed to discharge, then you can get a pressure that's too high, like in glaucoma. Uh, if it's not allowed to leave this area or you get too much. Or you can get a pressure that's too low if it actually uh, is not being replenished or it leaves that, that area too quickly. You need to know the vitreous humor. This is not replenished. What you got is what you got. And then the retina right here, which is where the light is focused. And then also the lens. This is the lens of the eye, which allows the light to be focused onto the retina. We'll get into the eye quite a bit more in a later chapter when we get into light. The eye is probably one of my favorite organs. Do you all have a favorite organ? No? What is it? The heart? You're a softy. I like the eye. No, uh, the heart's a good one, too. All right. Um, okay, so you need to know the vitreous humor. You should already have this. But this is not replenished. It helps keep the shape. You also need to know the lens and the retina. If we want to measure the pressure in the eye, right? So that aqueous humor, it can either have high pressure or low pressure. High pressure if it's not allowed to discharge or you're replenishing it too quickly. Or low pressure if it discharges too much or it's not replenished. Uh, so you need to be able to measure the pressure in that. Has anybody ever had the pressure, their intraocular pressure measured? You have? They do it often at the eye doctor, right? How do they do it? Okay, yeah, you can either have a pin, like a pin that actually comes out and touches your eyeball, or sometimes they use a puff of air. They, uh, well, I'm going to show you, a, a, it's called a, a tonometer. A tonometer is used to measure the pressure of your eyeball. Does it hurt when they do it? Oh, they numb your eye. Okay. What's that, Bria? Do they put those metal clamps on your eyes and pull them back like this, like they do in the horror movies? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. So a tonometer is used to measure the pressure of the eye. used to measure the intraocular pressure. Tests for things like glaucoma or low pressure of the eye. Um, and it can, I'm going to show you a video, but you do need to know sort of roughly how it works. It either uses like a pin, it comes out and touches the eye, or, or you can have just like a burst of air. And I'm going to show you a video. This is not a person video. It's a, a veterinarian. Because you also have to measure the intraocular pressure of your pets, right? Because they can have vision problems as well. And he's using a tonometer. You just need to know what a tonometer is. And I think it must be terrible to be the dog of a vet, especially one that likes to put videos on YouTube, because you're always going to be, you know, the experiment. <laughs> Here, let me show how to do this on my beagle. All right. Um, 
So that's the tonometer. Uh, that's it for the eye. And we have a few more minutes. We're just going to do the brain really quickly. It's just like a few minutes. So the brain, and then we'll be done. Um, so the brain, we have the skull, the brain sits in, uh, the cranial and the facial bones. the meninges. Saying that right? Meninges? Sure. Meninges. Those are the three membranes that cover the brain. We'll talk about the brain later when we get into electricity because we'll talk about how electrical signals move between the neurons. But for now, we're really just sort of focusing on the fluid of the brain. Uh, and so, the, these are the three membranes that cover the brain. And these membranes contain a cerebral spinal fluid. Our CSF. Uh, this CSF helps to protect the brain. Basically, your brain floats in this CSF, and it helps to cushion it from uh, any injuries or whatever. So the CSF cushions the brain. It also helps to regulate blood flow to the brain. Uh, I don't know how it does that. I'm not sure. I'll look into it. You all know? That's what I read. Okay. All right, so it regulates blood flow to the brain. And typically, you have about three-quarter cup of this CSF. So if you could you know, pop a hole in your head and pour it out, you'd get about three-quarter cup out. Um, you can have too much of this CSF because you don't drain it off or you're producing too much of it. So you can have problems if you have too much of it. This is called hydrocephalus. This is too much CSF. If you have uh, too much, it, it causes an increased intracranial pressure. That can be damaging to the brain. So you need to know what hydrocephalus is. You can also have a lack of CSF. I don't know what the technical name for this is, but a lack of CSF can cause brain injuries as well. Because remember, the CSF helps to cushion the brain. If you don't have enough of that, then the brain can hit against the skull, or it can it can be damaged just because it doesn't have that cushion that's afforded by the CSF. Let's watch this little video. It's interesting. I know we're done, sort of, but 